All right, sweet. So, so yeah, that was that was like this what like I said all but forgotten moment that that really uh you know, that wasn't the moment where I was like suddenly cast myself into the world of agriculture. So I continued um organizing within the climate movement and eventually um at that time I was in New York and uh as I was starting to feel some of the limits of especially the the kind of nonprofit uh uh led climate movement and the the dynamics that didn't quite feel like the solidarity and and people power that I I uh that had really inspired me to to commit. Um, there was two fracked gas pipelines that had just uh, gotten their basically their last permits that they needed before construction in Virginia. So I decided to quit my job and move back to Virginia, and throw myself into the boonies of Southwest Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains. Um, you know. Side note, this was in the after the immediate aftermath of of the first election of Trump and and uh, you know, I was in so-called Trump country um, uh, that that following year in 2017, sitting at dinner tables with a lot of uh, mostly farmers. Um, it just so happened that the Mountain Valley pipeline in particular, um, its proposed construction route was going directly through a lot of family farms. Um, and I don't think it was an accident. I think they might, I think it would be wise of them to not try to build a pipeline that would go through any of the big corporate agribusinesses that have the lawyers and the money power to um, contend. So there was a lot of family farmers who were, you know, facing down the barrel, uh, pipeline barrel of, of losing their livelihood, of losing their, um, Losing the 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 businesses that they had, they had built and had just started to become solvent, you know, these are this was my second introduction to the world of agriculture. Again, um, uh, accidental uh, uh, and not intentional, um, but driven by my work in the climate movement. And for about two years, um, I worked with those those farmers and other landowners in rural Southwest Virginia and resisting the construction of that pipeline. Um, and eventually, you know, the various means of, of resistance and, and land defense um, uh, uh, failed. I, I, you know, there's nicer words to say, but that pipeline is now flowing gas. So uh, I want to be, I want to uh, be measured about that. Um, and it was a very interesting moment for me, and I and I and I, I really cite this moment as when something shifted, or I noticed that something had shifted first and foremost in my heart, um, and then you know, following and in consequence in my mind as well, because when I joined that fight, I was really really adamant that this was not about the land, and it was not about trees, and it wasn't even about the farms, it was about people, you know, I didn't want, I, I remember being like, I'm not a tree hugger, that's not, that's not like what this is about, this is about the climate, this is about justice, this is about people, um, and when I uh, saw uh, the, the, the devastation of land that I had ended up spending a lot of time defending and a lot of time just like with and within. Um, I remember having, uh, you know, a really ugly cry. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just like, what? Like, I'm not, I'm not a tree hugger. Like, I, you know, I, but I felt something. I felt this connection that kind of subliminally and subconsciously had, had um, influenced my sense of self and my sense of relationship to land. Um, so, that that moment obviously impacted me. So then when that family um, that I'd been mo working most closely with, uh, when they had to abandon their their farm because their their cattle were dying um, and they, they had three children and it was just a very violent environment um, in the midst of construction, they they essentially 
moved in with a friend um, across the state and invited myself and my collective um, uh, to basically, you know, take over uh, and at, le at the very least to, to be able to move in uh, to the farm and, and monitor construction, et cetera. Um, and the way I explain how <laughs> I got into farming was, you know, I moved in and woke up the next morning on 50 acres and it was just like, uh, I, I guess, I guess we're farming now. I guess that's what we're doing now. And I uh, planted my first seeds and wrote my first to-do list. And that to-do list is unfinished seven years later. Um, so I, I, I share that story. Um, and there's, there's more to it that I'll kind of loop back towards the end. But I share that story um, uh, to say that though my the, the reasons that I got into agriculture, that I got into food system work, that I got into land stewardship was fully kind of uh, consequential and random and unintentional. Um, uh, the reasons I've continued to farm and continue to deepen my kind of involvement in, in not just farming, but in the work of YFC, of Young Farmers Coalition and other organizations that are that are trying to um, support farmers so that we can actually introduce and, and, and uh, instigate a paradigm shift in agriculture uh, at the level of our society. Um, you know, those reasons have continued to show up and convince me that I'm situated in the right place. Um, and these days, I no longer really introduce myself as a climate activist. I'm, I'm a farmer and that's, that's who I am. But what being a farmer means, um, uh, especially in this moment, in this era of climate survival, is being on the front line you know, of, of climate disaster it's, it's, it's about being on the front line of potential climate mitigation and ongoing efforts to mitigate climate crisis and chaos. Uh, and also uh, farmers uh, pose the potential to be on the front line of climate resilience and climate adaptation. So in a way, by saying and identifying myself uh, as a farmer, it's, it's, it's a um, indirect way of, of uh, telling, uh, or what it really means to me is actually deepening my commitment to building the, a future worth living in and building a future where the vision of apocalypse that we're all kind of uh, enduring right now uh, can be replaced by a vision of uh, climate resilience and rooted in agriculture and rooted in community control of land. Um, uh, and and food sovereignty. So I'm gonna pause for my own sake. Um, but if there are any, give me one sec. There we go. So I'm gonna pause and here we go. We're gonna see if 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 y'all uh, can meet me where I'm at and 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 chime in. But. Uh, what is your, I, mean, I want, before I proceed, it's, it would be helpful for me to know like how much we're already on the same page, right? So when you see these words and, 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 and you know, hear the statement I just made that farmers are on the front line of climate disaster impacts, on the front line of climate mitigation, and on the front line of, of climate adaptation and resilience, does that map on? Like, does that, is that like, yeah, duh? Um, does that, raise questions, um, you know, uh, let me know what your impressions are of that. And if you're, you want to put it in the chat, I will, I will, I'll appreciate that, but also you feel free to come off mute or raise your hand. I, I, I can start and, uh, I'd say, given that this is a front porch, I'll just be comfortable and say this: that um, I think that I think I think that farmers are on the front line 
of climate disaster impacts and farmers are on the front line of climate mitigation and farmers are on the front line of climate adaptation and resilience with everyone else. And I think that of the people who are on the front lines, farmers are some of the less resource folks mm -hmm. to be on the front lines of all these. Like I think farmers are on the front lines of all these, but are not, are not supported for like, as people who are on the front lines of all these things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, I think that's, that's true, obviously at the level of our, our government and et cetera, but unfortunately it's, it's been true even at the level of the climate movement there, there isn't, um, you know, there still is yet to be this like actual integration of, of agriculture as one of the, you know, proven by like, not just by like, you know, nerdy farmer people, but by like institutions like the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, um, uh, that some of the most like viable uh, means of actually mitigating climate disaster and climate change are, are through kind of these organic approaches that ultimately come down to land management. And when we're talking about land management, um, uh, agriculture is the career or the occupation that is at once uh, uh, industry and a source of production, while at the same time, a means of land management. Um, obviously, not always to the benefit of the land and to the climate. Other thoughts? I've, I've, I'm, I'm practiced in the art of enduring awkward pauses. So, this is Evan. Um, I put this in the chat, but I think, especially to the first point in this like list of three like being on the front lines of climate disaster impacts. I also like to frame it as like farmers, including farm workers, especially, right? And I think like to Adolfo's point earlier when he mentioned that, you know, like farmers being super under-resourced, I think farm workers are even even less so, right? And uh, um, yeah, and there's some, some initiatives and in, I think at the micro level, like in my state in Colorado, the Farm Worker Bill of Rights, right? To like try to try to empower those folks to not have to feel the brunt of these things. But the reality is, you know, especially on like the big farms and things, um, yeah, farm workers are really feeling feeling the heat literally out west. So Secretary, you're muted. Sorry, uh, basically plus one to that. Um, I'm seeing in the chat, uh, let's see, Nikki, I uh, saw that you said I'm in the disaster zone. I'm assuming you mean um, in Western North Carolina and had an impacted farm. Could say something if you want. Um, do you want, do you want to share some, I mean, especially on that, first point, farmers are on the front line of climate disaster impacts. And maybe not right now, um, but please, anyone who is from North Carolina, especially since, you know, our intention was to feature report backs um, from people on the ground there. Um, yeah, please do uh, fill in when you can and where you can. I'm going to give one more opportunity if there's any other thoughts. Um, Especially, you know, if you are a farmer, 
like to what extent moving past just like the experience of disaster you know to what extent you're you imbue your work with a consciousness of a climate conscious kind of lens through uh, efforts to adapt and mitigate and etc Okay, great, we'll continue. Um, so let's, again, this is this is just like a, a lens for us to, to look through together, um, but it's not, it certainly is not, uh, you know, a, a, a total encapsulation of the subject. Um, but I'm gonna move through each of these points, these three points so that we can really fill in uh, what what I mean um, uh, when when I'm I'm talking about the different modes of of being on the front line. So uh, climate, starting with climate disaster, this might be the one that is is most obvious, not just to farmers, but but uh, people in general, because you know I've I've seen now that every year now. There's, there seems to be some kind of article in, you know, even the New York Times talking about the floods in Iowa or the fires in, in on the West Coast um, or, uh, you know, extreme heat waves or extreme kind of uh, 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 conditions of, of heat in, in the Southeast and the Deep South. And, you know, the impact that that's having on farms and kind of expectations that follow that about the shortages that we might see in the grocery store. Um, um, and even beyond these kind of extreme incidents, uh, there are fewer places, you know, agriculture is something that has really been developed on the basis of, of a relatively predictable climate and relatively predictable conditions of our ecology. You know that that is that is the base condition through which agriculture can has ever been able to exist and and can exist. Um, and even like for me in Virginia, you know, uh, where hurricanes are not as common and these kind of extreme weather events are not as common yet, um, late a late frost or an early spike of heat um, in May, you know can be devastating. Uh, I know two years ago, we had a really unusually late frost um, uh, towards the end of May, right after people had planted their whole tomato crop, you know, and, and, and summer crop. And, you know, farmers had to deal with the total loss. And you can't then just like, you know, for for farmers, it's not as simple as like, all right, you know, we'll just plant them all again tomorrow. You know, a lot of these things are not as um, resistant uh, to to impacts like that. Um, or for example, uh, even the general kind of heat dome effect that we experienced in most of the United States this year. Um, I remember like frequently getting <laughs> notifications on my phone of like you know stay indoors today like there's a high uv index and like high kind of risk of uh, heat stroke and farmers can't i mean obviously there's there's a uh, a growing vertical farming and indoor farming industry but uh for the most part and and uh you know for and until that can fully replace outdoor agriculture you know, it's not an option to shelter indoors on a day where the conditions are really hostile to human well-being. Um, last summer, there was the, I don't know if everyone can remember the kind of apocalyptic images uh, and experience of the wildfires from up in Canada and the drift of, of smoke that, you know, traveled all the way into the deep south. Um, and once again, you know, I was getting notifications on my phone, like the air quality is really bad today. Don't go outside, like stay inside. Um, and, you know, for all those who are 
situated in the work of farming, you know, we have to part of our part of our job essentially is uh, is is defined by the kind of rhythm of the season and the needs that come up throughout the day. But well, we don't have that flexibility to just, um, you know, uh, to insulate ourselves from some of these conditions uh, and 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 pivot in that way. So there's this is of many examples um, and many more extreme examples, of course, um, entire farms and infrastructure being wiped out by massive floods or hurricanes. Um, you know, the the from from the kind of mundane to the extreme um uh the impacts are widespread and those impacts when they happen in one place right when when there's floods in Iowa or wildflowers in uh California um uh there's the implication of possible food shortages nationally but as the tempo and the uh, intensity of crisis increases, you know we're 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 edging closer and closer to situations where simultaneously there's devastation to crop production in in the Midwest uh, for you know record kind of downpours of of rain, while record droughts in the West Coast and extreme heat and hurricane in the Southeast are something that are happening simultaneously. And in that kind of situation, we go from, uh, you know, a, a, a mitigatable shortage of, of food that can just be kind of offset by, by supplying the food from other regions um, or internationally to a, a full on kind of uh, crisis of, of, of uh, food production uh, in our society. And when we think about climate mitigation, you know, this is something that I've been been really uh, sharing a lot uh, when when I'm in, especially when I'm in climate movement spaces, because when we think about crisis and climate crisis, we often just think of the like direct impact of a climate event. You know, um, you know, a fire and uh, a flood and the kind of like. Uh, universal impact that that has on the place that it hits. But in reality, um, uh, there's the, the event, the climate event, a weather event, it manifests itself through the medium of existing, of the existing social, economic, and political landscape. What do I mean by that? Um, uh, I've spent some time in, in Nevada uh, this past summer. And, you know, when a heat wave in a place like Nevada, that's already a, a desert, um, uh, hits a community um, uh, or a region, um, it's not that everyone experiences that heat wave simultaneously and identically. If you don't have housing and you don't have the option to shelter, um, the kind of toll of that heat wave is going to manifest itself through that existing social condition um, and the social injustices and inequities and, uh, uh, applied by those systems. You know, that's just one example, but we can think of it in this context of the food system and the agricultural system. Um, when we live in a system as we do today, where uh, that favors uh, strongly through subsidies, uh, through access to crop insurance, um, that favors agribusiness and corporate consolidated agriculture. Um, uh, when there is a climate disaster that creates a complete loss, crop loss or crop failure, um, it's the people that don't have access to crop insurance um, or the people that can't afford it because they can't have access to the subsidies that the government provides on inequitable kind of lines uh, in our current system. Those are the people that don't have an opportunity to recover. Um, and those are often people who um, didn't necessarily inherit their land or didn't have the stored capital to just purchase land. So they've had to take out loans and a crop loss, uh, you know, 
dramatically affecting your revenue that year can mean by the end of the year, you default on that loan and you've now lost your business, you've lost your land. So that's not, that's just, you know, to give us the sense that like, when we're thinking about um, climate disaster, but also climate mitigation, the solutions are not just at the level of carbon, you know, um, the climate crisis is not just a phenomenon of, of carbon parts per million per million in, in the atmosphere. Um, uh, the, the climate crisis is, is just as much a crisis of power, of, of who has power and, and who is marginalized um, in, in, in the landscape of, of our social and economic and, and political uh, system, you know? So uh, again, the work of, of social justice, the work of shifting some of these policies uh, that, that uh, disenfranchise and, and disempower and um, disincentivize uh, young farmers like ourselves um, uh, from being able to have a opportunity to be secure and successful in the food system, climate disasters just exacerbate those inequalities um, and they manifest directly through them. I'm going to pause again to see if, uh, if, that's, if that's tracking or if people have anecdotal uh, experiences um, uh, in this particular kind of uh, synthesis of, of climate events and the existing um, social, economic, and political landscape that they manifest through. Keep rolling. What time is it? Okay, cool. About three forty-five. Okay, so so let's get into the climate mitigation. Um, I there we go. Um, so on on the left side we have modern agriculture, also called industrial cap agriculture. Uh, sometimes called capitalist agriculture, um, but essentially that's a, the, the best way I've heard it kind of summed up is it's an agriculture that's more like a factory in, in a field. Um, so that's the current paradigm of, of U.S. agriculture. Um, you know, in a place like Virginia, it looks like a thousand acre monocrops of corn and soy um, in places like Iowa, it looks like uh, CAFOs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, I'm kind of, I'm going to use the umbrella term of just traditional agriculture and alternative agriculture, but that umbrella encapsulates a lot of emerging and like kind of ancient technologies of agriculture. Um, so just so we have some shared language, uh, this includes agroecology and you know whereas modern agriculture is the factory in the field agriculture agroecology is 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 based on approaches um that uh try to mirror and situate themselves within and 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 are shaped by the surrounding ecology rather than the inverse where agriculture shapes the surrounding ecology um so it's a holistic and integrated approach that applies ecological and social concepts um, uh, into the design and management of food systems. Another regenerative ag is again, something that is be quickly becoming uh, uh, more common language, even at the level of the USDA. And regenerative agriculture is an agriculture that's specifically uh, focused on uh, approaches that can serve and rehabilitate um, the topsoil uh, and strengthen the health of that soil and its ability to sequester carbon. 
Regenerative ag often integrates animals into to the farming system as a method to restore degraded soils. Um, and then traditional farming, which is more or less, you know, what is defines farming globally. Um, uh, though uh, the top 1% of farms own 70% of the land, um, uh, the majority of farms are small holdings that in places like where I'm from, Egypt, um, uh, north of Cairo, where instead of seeing like a, an array of, or instead of seeing a kind of mute and monotone landscape of large land holdings, you see an array of, of diverse two to three acre, um, you know, machine unintensive farms sprawling across uh, the region. So this is the agriculture that emphasizes local indig and indigenous knowledge and cultural heritage um, and is rooted in centuries old practices. It's common geared towards subsistence farming for local consumption, et cetera. Of course, that's again, not encapsulating all of the different alternative forms of agriculture, traditional forms, we have organic agriculture, biological farming, silvopasturing and polyculture, um, permaculture, just to name a few. Um, uh, but again, this was just me doing my due diligence so that I can just start saying alternative ag or traditional ag so that y'all know I mean something that is far from a monolith, monolith and includes a lot of, 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 again, emerging and ancient technologies of and traditional technologies of ag. So, uh, again, climate mitigation, when we look at traditional and alternative agriculture, we see a re agriculture that relies on the plant's capacity to efficiently gather solar energy and convert it into forms usable by human society. It's, it's, it's an organic energetic system um, that is honestly brilliant and beautiful because it harnesses, you know, uh, an interspecies alliance with with uh, all of the different beings that are able to photosynthesize and convert uh, photosynthesis convert sun energy that is bombarding the earth constantly uh, into uh, forms that are metabolized by all other species, including humans, um, and can be used obviously um, uh, for more than just consumption um, or like. For more than just edible food consumption. Uh, when you compare that to this kind of inverted uh, paradigm where of modern agriculture, where the energetic basis is turned on its head and it uses past flows of heat and light from the sun in the form of fossil fuels. Um, because as we know, fossil fuels are just like the ancient kind of uh, store of, of carbon-based materials of, you know, millennia past. And what we see is a change from using the sun and water to grow peanuts to using petroleum to manufacture peanut butter. And obviously when we're thinking about climate change, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it really is especially kind of stark, the contrast of the two. Uh, and the implications uh, involved in them. Um, in our current system, you know, of the energy that is is used in the food system or, or put into production, only a third of that is actually um, dedicated towards the production of food. Um, another for another third is put into processing and packaging, um, and Another third is put into the distribution and preparation of food. Um, most of these, uh, all, all of these include like carbon intensive uh, inputs of energy. And then of course, uh, that whole system is stratified across the globe, um, you know, where strawberries are shipped from Mexico uh, and uh, wheat is shipped from uh, across the country and et cetera, et cetera. Avocados are shipped from the Caribbean. 
Um, so we have this system that essentially relies on um, uh, the fossil fuel intensive circulation of food in order to uh, meet the caloric needs of the planet um, as insufficiently as it does. So, you know, that first slide is kind of talking about the, the uh, carbon intensive uh, state of modern agriculture and contrasting that with a, a relatively carbon unintensive means of produce of food production and traditional and alternative me methods of agriculture. But beyond the, uh, uh, you know, reduced output of carbon and the possibility of a system that is carbon neutral, uh, alternative and traditional methods actually pose the possibility of a net negative uh, industry, which is very rare that there can be an industry that is net negative. But agriculture, um, uh, you know, the research is starting to become more and more, uh, is, is starting to confirm more and more the possibility that, again, not only can we can curb carbon output in our agricultural system, but the system itself can be a means of, of uh, drawing down carbon and sequestering it into the soil. Um, so a lot of that system is based off of how we treat and even see and understand the soil. Um, you know, the modern methodology treats the soil as something that is dead. So when we do so, we ought not be surprised when the graveyard spread. That system compacts the soil, which makes it less able to retain water or absorb water, um, which doesn't just make like a, a uh, the, the 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 plants and crops less resilient to a drought, but it also means that in the inverse situation or on the other side of the extreme, when there's a heavy rain, that rain, instead of being absorbed into the root structures in the soil, ends up just eroding the soil um, and and washing off into the nearest kind of storm drains and 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 uh, water and watersheds. Um, and at the same time, it's like it's like they 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 messed it up as bad as they could. So it, we're we're overly compacting the the soil in one sense. We're also overly tilling the soil. And when you over till the soil, that stored carbon is uh, oxidized. You know CO two. So you turn a physical stable form of carbon that is stored in the soil, uh, and it and it transforms into a uh, carbon dioxide. Um, that then is released back into the atmosphere. So this kind of practice is, is um, you know, totally in contradiction to what is actually, uh, you know, what, what the soil could actually be as, as a means of harnessing our potential to, um, to become a storehouse of carbon, where small changes in solid carbon count could cascade into massive reductions in atmospheric CO2. Estimates predict as much as nine gigatons uh, per year. Um, just so we're on the same page, uh, we currently, the global output of carbon is about 37 gigatons. So this is not an insignificant amount of the total output that could be sequestered um, through, you know, uh, knowledge intensive and climate conscious means of soil management. Any questions about, now that we're getting into some like headier stuff, any questions on, on this slide before I move on? All right, I'm gonna keep hustling because I'm, I'm starting to get us, I'm starting to feel like we're I'm preaching to the choir. So I want to get us towards like, you know, thinking into the future and, and into our immediate present as well. Um, so I'll just list these out and read them off, but agro, uh, I, traditional and alternative agricultural systems have a, a number of key traits that are relevant to climate resilience as well. Um, you know, they recycle biomass and promote healthy soil, adding soil organic matter. They strengthen the immune system of the larger farming system by promoting biodiversity 
um, of natural enemies of pests. They minimize the loss of water and biodiversity. They promote species and genetic level diversity over time and space. They tend towards localized economies, insulating communities from breakdowns and disruptions in our globally stratified supply chain. They promote methods of tending to the land that improves resilience against floods, mudslides, and droughts. And finally, they also fail far less. This is scientifically proven. They fail far less frequently than do monocrop systems to reaction in reaction to climate change induced disasters. And they better tolerate or bounce back from extreme weather events. You know, this is not to mention the, the work being done um, by farmers uh, around the country who are uh, doing research into an experimentation with um, getting ahead of the climate trends that are expected in our bioregions, our respective bioregions, where, you know, trying to grow uh, 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 crops that are um, not traditionally incorporated into American diet, but have a better chance of being resilient to the increased kind of uh, severity of droughts or to, uh, in Virginia, the, the fact that we're losing a spring season. Um, uh, so that work of, of trying to stabilize the impacts of food insecurity that's induced by uh, uh, climate events and the kind of uh, anticipation of furthered climate chaos by in the present now, season to season, uh, introducing new kind of crops into the system um, that have a, a chance of having longer, having more resilience and longevity in the future trends. Uh, I kind of already said this, so let's let's now let's now shift into like what this means. Um, all of that was just like a way to kind of, honestly, like something that I, for my own self, you know, I've been really thinking about because like I said, in reply to Adolfo's comment, like um, for some reason, farmers aren't at the table in the climate movement um, uh, or aren't in the vision of, you know, where the kind of technocratic solutions and the the CEOs of those companies will be included in what we imagine to be a solution to climate uh, climate change. You know, farmers are left out of the table, um, and uh, agriculture is kind of completely, um, or at least like uh, dramatically um, uh, dislocated from from that from that vision, and 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 also from the kind of supportive infrastructure um, to. Uh, support farmers in doing some of the most vital work um, that we currently can even conceive of in mitigating, adapting to, uh, and becoming more resilient in the face of climate crisis. Okay, before I keep going, once again, uh, pausing and encouraging uh, thoughts, question, anecdotes, manifestos, whatever, whatever y'all got. It's a conversation, y'all. Let's get it going. It see, it seems to be that the um that the uh the chat has some like really good comments. I know folks are not as willing, but I think uh, Tazy wrote something really cool. The concept of fossil fuels is past energy from the sun, and it seems to be also that Jesse wrote something. I don't know if if you all wanted to say something. Uh, about what what you wrote, like Jesse, your personal experience with wild with wildfires. Hi. So that was my first season, actually, as a farm worker, um, and I got I was lucky enough to have somebody who you know cared enough to at least go get a a harbor freight respirator. But we were out there, and it was the most like post-apocalyptic uh, sort of aesthetic I've ever been a part of, was trying to farm when the wildfire smoke was so thick you couldn't see 10 feet away. Um, and it was re it really brought into perspective for me, you know, these aren't issues that we can ignore. And, you know, being in Western upstate New York, climate change doesn't really seem like a thing 
that, you know, a lot of people are coming to this region to escape climate change uh, if they can, you know, and it's, we're not immune from it up here either. And then just since you called me out, the other thought I have is that farmers aren't at these tables because there is a, hopefully I'm, you know, it's another priest in the choir, maybe I'm calling myself out too much, but it's a class issue in this country. Uh, it's a unionizing issue. Um, and it's, it's really frustrating and uh, to watch happen that we all have these strong identities. You know, I'm a farmer, I, I work in ag, I work with animals, I do whatever, you know, and, and for some reason this gets overlooked and we could have so many allies out there if we talked about it as a class issue rather than a, you know, how divided they try to make us. And I'm going to be quiet now, just in case. <laughs> thank you. Yo, thank you for that, Jesse. I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're sharing, Jesse. And I think that, you know, I live in, I live in Asheville and we just got we just got hit right and i and i think i saw nikki uh uh i think nikki was was here from the organic uh the organic school uh, and like right next to us is um mary carol dodd who's like a like an amazing farm probably like like the best lettuce i've i mean we have these like farmers markets on Saturdays and people line up 30 minutes before. I'm sure Nikki knows about Mary Carol. And it's almost like the most fascinating thing is that Mary Carol is probably the most resilient person I've ever seen in my entire life. Cause after the Asheville thing and my partner, um, Ivy, uh, works with Mary Carol. She, she like farms with her at times and we're like, we're CSA members. And the first thing that Mary Carol pretty much said was we've got to like, we've got to, we've got to not sit down. We've got to actually feed people. Right. And we've got to continue farming. Like, it's like, it's not like, uh, it's not, it's not a choice here. Like we, like this is what we're doing. And I think for me, fundamentally speaking, in terms of what you were saying, it's like, I'm thinking about the smoke as what you like, the smoke is being like a, a massive, like barrier to doing this thing that like this, like super ethical or super, um, relational thing that, folks were called to do which is to farm and it's like that's the aspect that blows my mind like in terms of not being at the table it's because like folks are called to do this thing so like who better to speak about something than those who are called to feed others and like despite despite the conditions mm -hmm. yeah you know and and on that point of class like i think something that's been really striking to me uh or something that's been become more clear to me um, you know, is part part of the class divide is on these on uh, along the lines of of devaluing and kind of invisibilizing reproductive labor. You know, all of the labor um, that has uh, historically been engendered um, uh, and coincides with patriarchal kind of forms of society and power, um, but is not simply just like the work of birthing and raising children is it's is all of the work that goes into like creating the base conditions that allows human society and human people to reproduce themselves from one day to another you know so farming kind of it i i see farming as reproductive labor in that sense um the work of you know I, this was the kind of labor that during the covid19 pandemic or at least in the you know in the immediacy of that suddenly we started to really think about like <laughs> what kind of labor is essential and what is the labor that um you know enables society to 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 have a, a the basic conditions of of well-being um uh and survival um and you know a lot of the conferences or the you know movement gatherings um uh one kind of are put the pressure on people attending them to figure out like how to make it work. Um, you know, people who are raising children uh, or, uh, you know, are playing other roles in, in homemaking and the labor of homemaking that can't necessarily just call off work um, and are not given like options 
for uh, receiving like stipends to hire a babysitter or whatever that may be. Um, but at the same time, like even just the fact that like these things tend to happen like for farmers uh, relevant, relevantly, like these things tend to be scheduled like in the summertime, you know, where it's like these gatherings are um, in the peak season. So it's it's hard to even get like it's hard for us to even be at the table, you know, whereas like farmer conferences start like in November, you know, and they are all happening on the off season when farmers have time and to 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 pull away from the work of uh from their work you know um and i've i've been feeling that really intensely where it's like i'm trying to not like um you know get totally tunnel visioned and pigeonholed into the work of like agriculture and i want to be at these these other kind of like venues and and um spaces of movement building but it's like at a direct consequence of uh, you know, my body, uh, in the sense that I'm working 70 hours a week before and after to make sure like things are going to be okay while I'm gone. And, um, and then returning to like tomatoes that needed to get pruned and are now like have a blight and things of this nature where again, it's, it's the invisibility of agriculture, um, and the invisibility of reproduction, reproductive labor at large, you know, it plays in and it plays into like um, things as simple as like uh, uh, like when when these movements are converging and to what extent like they are intentionally and actively trying to support people and being able to come and be at the table. Um, looking at the chat just sharing a collection of some resources that the Midwest Vegetable Growers Network has collated about climate change research and adaptation strategies. Thank you for this. Um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna save this link for myself. Um, we are also applying for more grant funding to support hands-on learning opportunities about climate resiliency with the Midwestern farmers. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious, like, what uh sit to Sadie like do you are you finding that there are like a relatively solid amount of opportunities for that particular that particular like angle of funding of like research related to climate resiliency yeah um thanks for asking and i do have to hop off pretty soon i'm at a conference actually and have sessions starting in a few minutes but um was really happy to see this call hosted today because we just this week submitted two grant applications about delivering like climate resilience and adaptation education in partnership with midwestern farmers who are already doing that type of work um for context i work at a farmer support organization and um, coordinate the the InVeg network. Um, and I think I have seen more opportunities for financial support around climate resilience or climate adaptation coming on board recently. Um, sometimes it's also about looking at opportunities just for farmer education, and then we're the ones who build in that climate component. So for instance, we're delivering some virtual programming this winter um, about how to manage risk for farm businesses. And we have a couple of sessions that are related to how climate change is impacting being a farm, being a farmer. Um, but that wasn't part of the grant uh, request per se. We just decided that it's, it's important. That's what we've been hearing about all across the region as extreme weather events are happening more frequently. Um, and we do have a farmer committee who are compensated for their time and contribution because of grant funding. So it's been really important for us to be able to have them at the table. We plan either lunchtime or evening calls usually, and we know that you all aren't as, as um, able to hop online during the summer months. So we get as much done as we can sort of fall through spring um, in terms of assessing the the needs and interests and a lot of it has been really climate focused over the past couple of years so yeah I'm really happy to have had this opportunity to listen in today and if you are interested in 
um, Midwest area resources, definitely feel free to reach out. And thanks for the call. I do have to head out now. Thanks. So much. Thank you. So um, I wanted to offer like a, a metaphor for us to think of to like kind of think about the dynamic strategic implications and and strategic opportunities um uh and and that's kind of like you know in the one sense we have to know where we are and you know that's a lot of what this workshop is till this point focused on and a lot of like you know a very important part of the work of being able to describe you know the problems uh, and and accurately kind of assess and analyze them um, and be able to like, you know, spin off narratives and, and, and ways of making a compelling kind of case for that description of like where we're at, right? And then as we all know, you know, the work of like thinking about where we need to go, like that work of like prefiguring um, the future that we want to live in and, and what it would look like and, and the visions involved, like, so we have like um, our kind of uh, what's the word like our position and 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 our placement in the now, and then we have our destination, right? But the thing that that like misses, you know, there's a there's space in between there, and sometimes I think like uh, movements in the U.S. Um, uh, spend a lot of time uh, talking about the first thing describing the problems and then talking about like what we want and the visions for the future. Um, but there's not that much attention into the, the actual like engine that drives us um, from one place to another, right? And, you know, I am someone um, uh, that is completely kind of invested in and confident that the engine is always the people the engine the, the process of of change of movement of moving our society from one place to another that engine is propelled by the people by the organized people by people who are like um you know doing the day-to-day -day work of of creating the conditions creating the uh the the scaffolding creating the kind of communities um, creating the networks, creating the the actual kind of um, projects and campaigns that that move our society and and uh, alter our reality. Um, but you know, there's one other aspect to it, and I think this is where policy fits in. You know, I do not. I I work for the farmers young farmers coalition, and we are like a policy advocacy and oriented organization but we don't uh that doesn't mean that our theory of change is like the change comes from above right um and poli and policy changes in and of themselves change the world um but policy changes what i would say is like that's the that's the road that's the conditions of the road you know that's the like obstacles uh, and the the barriers on that road while the people are driving from here to there you know it's the uh it's the amount of gas stations uh that exist along the route to refuel and to resource you know the the engine uh of movements um you know it's it's those it's that kind of like the landscape that we're moving through and policy fits into this picture um not as the solution, but it creates the conditions through which we can build the solutions and we can kind of have relative, uh, that uh, the, the kind of obstacles and opportunities and resources and um, uh, et cetera, uh, that don't necessarily um, create the future we want to live in, but uh, enable us and 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 structure our ability to get there, you know, and to drive ourselves there as movements, as communities, as people. Um, so I'm offering that so that we can have like a sense of these, these elements, you know, we've talked about where we are, we have a sense of where we want to go, 
Um, but, you know, like, let's now let's start to think about like, what are the little ways, the big ways um, uh, that we can kind of get ourselves there and also like create the uh, conditions of our path that enable us to get there. Thanks for entertaining that. <laughs> um, so I'll just say, I'll just list these ones out and we'll, we'll take the last 15 minutes to, to continue our conversation. Um, but at the policy level, um, you know, these are, these are some of the like, you know, some of it coming from my own head and some of it directly reflective of work that we're doing in Young Farmers Coalition. We have a, a member of our policy team that is specifically oriented towards um, climate advocacy uh, in the farm bill. Um, and as many of y'all know, the Lasso Act encompasses at least some measures towards these, these different elements. So element one is reforming the subsidy system, curbing the subsidies that favor industrial ag, especially those that favor monocultures and creating incentives um, to transition to regenerative soil practices. Um, two, tax reform, uh, you know, utilizing tax reforms as, as push-pull factors that disincentivize farmland being transferred to agribusiness or to real estate development. And uh, on the pool side, incentivizes tra transfer of land uh, to, of retiring farmers and landowners to young and or BIPOC farmers. Um, Three, public investment, and this is, you know, tied into uh, what Sadie was just sharing, but, you know, a mass kind of public in investment facilitated by USDA policy that supports farmers to get over that hump, you know, of a transition to sustainable production, which would look like investment in all the needed infrastructure to local relocalize our food systems, um, uh, including local processing, local production of inputs, organic inputs, compost, kind of like municipal compost operations, um, et cetera. Um, antitrust law, uh, which is the dismantling of large corporations involved in agriculture. This is actually something that I learned a lot about and didn't know about prior to, before I was a young farmer employee, I was a young farmer fellow. Um, and I was in a fellowship specifically designed around the intersection of climate and and uh, and agriculture. It was called the Place Fellowship. Um, and yeah, antitrust law was one of the things that you know we were being taught about and learning about as existing kind of legal frameworks to curb against uh, the furthered consolidation and and incentivized kind of structures that. Um, enable these large corporate kind of agribusinesses that control, you know, the 1% of farm farms that control like 70% of the world's land maps. Um, supporting the development of community controlled agriculture, which is kind of the, the inverse of, of the prior point. So this would be policies that encompasses and encourages cooperative and collective ownership of land and agricultural production in the Lasso Act, you know, for direct example, uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, through the, through it's, it's, what's the right word? Uh, it's kind of embedding into USDA policy, uh, access of loans and public funding um, for not just private owners, but also for cooperative structures or for community land trusts, you know, these existing means of, of collective and, and cooperative ownership uh, that till now are not necessarily encapsulated as like uh, eligible uh, uh, for USDA funding. And then finally, parity pricing. Um, so, you know, we're talking about all of these actual, the value that, that regenerative practices have the value that like um, uh, climate conscious soil management and landscape management and ecological management has and increasing biodiversity and incubating kind of our food system from severe uh, weather conditions, et cetera. All of these values are, are, 
are are you know useful and important and and are objectively kind of uh can be objectively measured however they're not included in how we value you know uh the production uh, of those farms you know which are still just kind of uh competing against the prices that are set by these corporate consolidated monoculture based industrial ag um so creating a value system a price system that that actually um incur encourages and compensates um uh the people that are doing regenerative ag that are doing you know climate conscious modes of agriculture that sequester carbon for that to be reflected in the price of of the products that um result from that that method of of ag so this is just like some of some of the ways a very limited set and you know one that is not nearly as radical as what ultimately will be needed but is immediately kind of possible um and then finally you know like i said where we are where we're trying to go and the road in between what that leaves out is the engine is what's going to move us um so while we're advocating for policy change and educating about the kind of stuff we've been talking about today we have to be organizing you know we have to be organizing uh in a way that is is directly supporting each other you know um that's something that i would love to hear thoughts about and, and brainstorm with people now and in the future of like what can we do when there is the next kind of wildfire and the air quality is like you know poisonous uh and and etc cetera, etc cetera. all of these things that we're all in the chat saying like i'm directly like being affected right now you know what are ways that we can organize support mechanisms and systems um, where we can rely and lean on each other, where we can create like systems where if someone loses their crop um, uh, and and are at the threat of losing their business, there's there's relief. While we're while we're you know trying to change power at the top, which might be a longer journey and and uh, and and be a process that happens over you know years and decades. Um, what are the things we can organize at a local level, at a regional level? um that can uh start to prefigure and and immediately address some of the needs we have as farmers now so that we um uh you know so that we can actually like take on the the task that we ne we didn't necessarily choose um when we got into farming but we are all kind of situated within now which is like being on the front line of one of the most uh, uh, existential crises that humanity has ever felt um, or has ever experienced. So in the interest of time, this is actually on the top right. I do want to name that this was when I was a fellow, this was like the moment uh, the DC fly-in event where there's like hundreds of farmers, young farmers from across the country. And it was like, this beautiful space of of people and that totally stood in opposition to like the composition of of uh white dominated agriculture um uh that exists in the US today. And I remember just like being in this room and looking around and and wait, is that Evan? Oh <laughs> I think I see Evan. <laughs> um I remember being in this room and and feeling like so inspired and feeling like whoa, this is this is this is not just important for me and for like agriculture and for us as farmers, like something felt like super powerful about there being like a, a coalition of young farmers who can lead in the realm of agriculture, but also can be like contend for leadership in society, can 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 occupy a role of, of leading us through crisis because we're the most proximate to those crises um, and everyone needs food. And when we're thinking about apocalypse, you know, uh, when we're thinking about climate catastrophe, you know, the things that we get scared about is how are we going to eat, you know, and we're at the exact kind of intersection, the exact, the exact kind of like edge, uh, cutting edge of 
of the the solutions um, to this very real and uh, existential threat uh, to the to the good life and to life on our planet. So I need to stop talking, and we have about five minutes, um, which I'm terrible at monitoring how long I've been talking. So apologies if I dragged a little long, but please like in the last five minutes in the chat or on mic, um, what are the impressions that you're kind of taking away or what are the questions you're leaving with? Um, or even just like, what is the feeling that you, that you have uh, after engaging in this combo? Um, I'm reading from Jamila saying that a big one for me as, as an aspiring first-gen regenerative farmer is current crop insurance systems and how much risk I'll be exposed to because of because I chose to farm in ways that encourage biodiversity rather than large swaths of monocrops. The later being the latter being more easily insured, absolutely. Um, which makes it harder for me to take that leap from a financial perspective, an element, another element that can create access issues. Um, another person, MF or M Espinoza, feeling uplifted, especially this month, feeling appreciation for people who choose to farm. Yeah, we out here, we out here, y'all. Elston. Hey, um, this is Elston. I just something that stuck out from what you were saying, Zachariah, was like that we're not at the table. And I think that um, like movement spaces obviously are all eating food when they're gathering and we just need to be at the table in that way. Like, um, yeah, it feels like if people are, are gathering at a time when farmers can't be there, um, then movement leaders like need to recognize that farmers are still there. Like they're still there providing the food. And so like, we're just undeniably at the table. And then on the flip side of that, like you were saying, you'll go to ag conferences and it's like just about like the scientific process and stuff like that. And those conferences need to be more political. Um, and I think that that is, I'm just thinking about like the nonprofit system a lot and, how that can be really um, hindering to our strategy. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's these like really entrenched silos and it's like, uh, it's, I, I feel optimistic. This is the optimism of the will. So I don't want to like be uh, harping on, you know, the, the limitations of the now, um, but the possibilities of like, you know, farmers, farmers are dealing with our own kind of, challenges um a lot of those having to do with like not even at the level like farming is hard in general but then you have this whole like challenge of like market fulfillment and being able to generate enough revenue and meanwhile there's like diff there's like this mutual aid movement who are creating these distribution hubs and there's the climate movement that like you know every time i go to a farmer conference all of the food is sourced by some local farm every time i go to a climate conference you know it's sourced by like chipotle or well, shouts out to Paul Lee. Um, but <laughs> um, you know, it's source, it's sourced not directly from uh the surrounding farms. So, you know, these could be like major for a farmer who like can expect that like once or twice a year they're gonna get a big purchase of then and be able to sell out all of their crops. You know, these things matter. Um uh and of course, you know, the climate movement uh has a lot to gain. Uh, and other movements have a lot to gain by partnering and, and and bridging with farmers. So it's it's like silos that are not just like a problem because silos are bad, but because we 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 have so much 
um, to, to gain so many problems that can be solved, uh, uh, so many individual problems that can be solved through this like bridging and converging. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, other things, we're about at time. Affirmation to stay on the farming path as hard as it gets. It's where we can change material conditions right on in this complex world. I'm also reminded how many comrades on the front lines with me. And they are also really cool people. That's as good of a note to end off on as any other. Thanks y'all for being here. Um, I always feel like when I'm with other farmers, I, I feel stronger. So thanks for being with me today. Um, and we'll see y'all at the next Front Porch. Peace. Thanks. Peace.